verses from Hebrews chapter 12 and, uh, and jump right into this. I'm excited about this word. I felt the courage of heaven in the room when I was preaching this first service. I felt the igniting of the fire of courage in the hearts of God's people. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm excited. I believe it's a, a word. I guess you could say this is part two of what I preached last week when I talked about a corporate encounter with God. How many were with us last week and you heard that? If you weren't, I would encourage you to listen to it. I believe it will encourage you. Um, It will be up on YouTube. Uh, We're running a little late on on some of those YouTube videos, but you can also catch it on Facebook or just go to our website. We have podcasts and uh, we're on Spotify, uh, or you can just listen to it directly from our website. How many like to listen to preaching when they're driving in the car and doing things, right? It's so good, man, just to get the word in you. All right, Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to start reading at verse 1. Therefore, say therefore. Therefore. How many know that therefore is there for a reason? And we'll talk about that in just a moment. The author of Hebrews says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded Say, surrounded Surrounded. by so a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that easily, so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Amen. Lord, thank you for this wonderful time with your people, this beautiful 11 a.m. service at Encounter Church in the summer. And Lord, I thank you that it's not 120 like it was in Vegas. And I love the rain. These people might not love the rain, but I love the rain because I'm from the desert. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'm, a, I'm already in a mood, y'all. So maybe if we could have our intercessors just pray for Pastor right now. Come on, somebody. I, I want to talk about, this verse has been burning in me, and I, I want to uh, talk about the concept of being surrounded first. I want to lay a foundation in this message, and we're going to go through these verses and have some other scriptures. We're going to go to some uh, scriptures in Hebrews 11, just a few verses, because the Hebrews 11 is the heroes of faith. How many love Hebrews 11 where it just opens up with the definition of faith? And then, and then the author of Hebrews begins to go and describe all of the men and women of the Old Testament. Um, and how many know that, that this, this is not just talking about that like in our sense now. How many know there's other people that have gone before us in the last 2,000 years of church history and so we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. And I want to talk about that. You know, um, in, in my own life, and I'm sure everybody could, you know, identify, there's times in life where you feel like you're all by yourself. Uh, you feel like whatever you're doing, you're doing alone. How many know what I'm talking about? Now, if you've ever been in ministry, I don't, I don't understand this fully, but sometimes in ministry, especially as a senior leader, um, a senior pastor role, uh, you know, we spent many years, you know, I, I led worship for Randall Cunningham, I was an associate pastor, and I, I spent many years as a worship pastor and an associate pastor, and I thought that ministry, if I planted a church, it was just going to be a blast, like preaching and doing worship and doing what I love, but then I found out when you step into a senior pastor role, it's a different weight that you carry. Uh, not a heavy burden, God empowers us, but it's a different responsibility, so how many know if you're carrying something that you're not used to, if you got weak knees, metaphorically, you're going to feel it. Yes. And, and so I remember the, this feeling, this awkward, strange feeling of like feeling alone. Like you, you may not realize this, but when you're uh, in, in ministry or in, and some of you probably know exactly what I'm talking about, it's like it's hard to even have friends sometimes. But how many have ever felt like that in life? Like maybe... You f- don't feel seen. You know, we talked about the story of Leah a couple weeks ago where she's just trying to get her husband to love her and she's having babies and the Lord's blessing her and, and she, she finally gets fed up and says, you know what, this time 
I will praise the Lord. And she names her son Judah. And there's something about just learning, uh, learning that we're not alone. The Bible says that we are surrounded by. When you feel alone in ministry, alone in life, we have to recognize the voice of God and the encouragement. How many know that words contain spiritual substance? You all know the verse in Proverbs, death and life is in the power of the tongue, right? We, gotta, we have to guard our mouths and be careful what we say. I'm getting really convicted right now. But how many know that there are words, Ephesians 4.29 says that there are words that can corrupt and there are words of, great, uh, words of honor that can impart grace. Your words can literally impart grace and courage to people in your life. And there are people in your life, and sometimes we don't even recognize it. We think we're alone, but we're not alone. We're surrounded. Not only is God with us, but we are surrounded by the family of God. How many know that the body of Christ isn't just a local assembly like this church? We're not just 300 plus people. There are, there's a body of Christ in the city of Rochester. Come on. And it's a beautiful body of Christ. And how many know that there is a larger body of Christ in the world that's over 2 billion people? multiple denominations and listen and I don't just look at that negatively like yeah I believe that God is unifying his church but sometimes what if God can take you know our frailty and we end up splitting up over silly doctrinal issues and there's different denominations but we agree on the essentials but what if God can take that and use a denomination to reach somebody that wouldn't be reached unless there was a denomination denomination I don't have a problem with I have a problem with denominational ism it's when that's the method, the only way. You have to be a part of a denomination. But how many know there's a larger body of Christ? And the author of Hebrews is talking about the, the heroes of faith. And I want to encourage you that when you don't feel like there's someone in your corner, there, is, there are people that are around you that God is speaking through to encourage you to run the race with endurance. And you might feel alone, but I have a word for you. You're not alone. The same, the same book in chapter 13, he says, he's quoting Deuteronomy. God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And there's something that is holy about realizing when we come together, there is a, a spiritual reality that not only are we present with the Lord, but in all of heaven, every saint, every church father, come on, every reformer that has gone before us is worshiping Jesus in heaven. We're not alone. And all of heaven is behind us. All of the angels of heaven are behind us. And we're not alone. And I've learned in, in my life, like when I feel alone in ministry, or I, I remember early on in ministry, I remember... Uh, you know, my wife and I uh, could tell you all sorts of stories, but one story, I was an associate pastor, and one of her friends had a niece that, that died, and it was a tragic event. Uh, she was not a believer. She snuck out of her house. She was partying with friends, and she, um, she got in a car accident. The car rolled, and, and it was just horrific. She was 16 years old, and the church they were a part of, um, they didn't have anyone that was able to do the funeral. So she's like, well, my friend's husband is a pastor at another church, and I was an associate pastor. So she called, would you please come pray with the family? Like, this family's broken. They don't know what to do, and told us a story. So I, I, it took some courage for me, but I don't even know, like, I don't even know how to pastor. And I'm like, I, I don't even, and, and, I'm, and, and I felt, there's times in my life as a young leader, I'm like, I need a pastor. Like, I need someone to pastor me, and I'm trying to help these broken people, and I'm broken. Hello? It's like trying to give people money and you broke. <laughs> I don't got no money. <laughs> it's hard to fit. It's, and you don't fix people. It's hard to love people that are broken when you're broken too. And I, I remember, and, and I'm, I was like, Lord, why is this the first memorial service that I'm doing? Like, I, I always dreamt as a, as a young leader, like, you know what? I could do a memorial service. Some grandpa or grandma served the Lord all their life and graduates to glory. I would love to honor their life. And everyone's like, man, God is good. And, but this was a 16-year-old girl that probably wasn't a believer. How do you navigate that? Hello? 
And so I show up to pray with the family. I remember we get in a circle and I'm like, hey, I'm just here to, to love on you guys. You're, you're, sometimes we don't need to give people an answer when they're hurting. You just weep with them and, and embrace them. All the time we're trying to give somebody an answer to the divine why behind something. What if there is no divine why? Well, everything happens for a reason. No, that's not true. Some things have no meaning. Evil has no meaning at all. We live in a broken world. It's quiet in here. Y'all need STSL. We go through all that stuff. Come on. So I, I pray with the family, and I'm, I, we're joining hands, and this guy next to me, long-haired dude, is like, whoa, bro, and you were praying just now. It was crazy, man. I just felt this thing in my chest. And, uh, like the Spirit of God touched him, man. It was so powerful. I didn't know what I was going to say to these people. What am I going to say? And I... I and I'm just like, I just got to release the peace and the love of Jesus and give people an opportunity to, to receive Jesus into their life. So I asked the family, I said, do I have your permission to just share the, on the love of God? And I said, absolutely. So I didn't know how many people were going to come to the funeral. Again, I didn't want this to be my first funeral, but I had to rise up and be courageous and love these people. And, um, I, and I thought maybe 50 to 100, over 500 people. I walk into this chapel and it's packed like standing room. It was just packed out. I remember I was shaking like I had barely preached any sermons. I'm like, how am I going to? So I get up and I preach Jesus. But there's times in my life and in ministry, I feel like unseen, discouraged, alone. And I'll never forget words from somebody who's a spiritual father in my life. And it's helped me recognize the people around me that God is speaking through. Sometimes we don't realize there are people around us God is speaking encouragement through. But because we allow familiarity to breed contempt, we just, it's like Christian cliche. Oh yeah, bless you, brother. You know, And even when we say like, bless you, brother, do you realize there's power? We're like literally releasing a blessing of heaven. I mean, they're not just words. That's what I'm trying to say. And so I remember a spiritual father in my life when I was uh, pastoring at a young age and uh, early, well, I wasn't that young, but um, young spiritually. And, and I remember, I'll never forget these words to this day. Larry Titus, he says, I'm behind you 100%. Not only are there people right now, leaders, people, that are surrounding you, the family of God, somebody that's nearby. And if you don't feel like you have anyone that's there to tell you that, I'm here to tell you, I'm behind you 100%. I'm for you. You're not alone. God's with you, and we're with you. I'm with you. I'm for you. I want to see you come alive in your gift and your call. And I'll, I'll never forget those words. And I, now I think about other words. I think about my, my own dad, my father. And I, I could hear his voice just the way, hey, buddy, like the way he talks. I find myself talking like him and, and loving like him. And I'll never forget his words to me. I can hear him, go get him, buddy. Whatever I did, whatever I was doing, if I'm preaching or if I'm a, a, a banker and I'm doing loans and mortgages and stuff, go get him, buddy. And there's something about hearing the voice of God through people, the resounding voice of the Father, encouraging you, saying you're not alone. And the author of Hebrews saying, not only do we have one another now, which is known as the church militant, every person that's alive right now that knows Jesus is a part of his body. Amen? Amen. We're known as the church militant. We are still evicting the enemy out of territory that no longer belongs to him. Now, how many know we don't fight the devil? The devil's been defeated. We just execute victory that was won 2,000 years ago. But also, we have the church triumphant. All those who have graduated to glory that are cheering us on. Come on, think about all the reformers. Think about Martin Luther and every revivalist, every early church father, every martyr, every saint. I think about Santa Claus. Come on, somebody. Good old Saint Nick who punched heretics in the face and loved the poor. A cloud of witnesses surrounds us. All of heaven is behind you. Amen. Sarah, when you lead worship, all of heaven is behind you. Amen. Now, the author of Hebrews begins to tell us some things that we need to do. And I was thinking about this verse. I've been meditating. We're going to go back to Hebrews 12. I'm going to read a couple verses. This is so powerful because as Christians, we need to learn to walk in this victory. We need to learn to receive the encouragement 
people, you know, sometimes as a, even as a young man, it was hard for me to receive encouragement from my parents because there was familiarity and I didn't honor. And when you don't honor someone, it's hard to actually receive from them. You, I don't even think it's possible. It's like trying to be taught and being unteachable. It's like, it's like oh, yeah, I want, pour into me and your heart's totally shut off. And I've learned to listen to the words of God, the words of encouragement from people in my life. And it, it, it does something. But now the author starts with therefore, and therefore is there for a reason. Hebrews chapter 11 goes through all the heroes of faith. And at the end, in verse 32, I want to read these couple of verses to you in the Passion. And what more could I say to convince you? For there's not enough time to tell you of the faith of Gideon, Barak. I didn't know Barack Obama was in the Bible. Come on, somebody. Samson. I'm just messing you guys. Jephthah. David. How many love King David? Come on, man. The man after God's own heart. Samuel and the prophets. Now look at verse 33. I want to encourage you with this. Through faith's power, they conquered kingdoms, established true justice. Their faith fastened onto their promises and pulled them into reality. Wow. Their faith fastened onto promises and pulled them into reality. Through faith's power. Now, I want to say this real quick. Faith is radical trust and rest in Jesus. It's not your ability to believe. It's not your ability to do. You enter rest when you have faith. You doubt when you have faith. I don't know if this chair is going to hold me. That's faith. Radical rest and trust. Through faith's power, they, all the cloud of witnesses, all those who have gone before us, the Old Testament prophets and, and the men and women of God, with the, God's covenant people, it says they conquered kingdoms. Say conquered kingdoms. Conquered kingdoms. Man, we right now need to release the kingdom of heaven so that every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus is Lord. Yeah. And we as the people of God are called to release the kingdom of God everywhere we go. They established true justice. Say true justice. true justice. Their faith fastened onto their promises and pulled them in reality. I think about David, King David, who, I mean, one of the most famous stories is when he took out that giant. And he, went first with his words, he prophesied. He said, you going down, brah. I'm paraphrasing, right? You defied the army of the living God. You're going down. He had a staff, a sling, and a stone. You know where he got the stones? From a river. And he reached in and he got five smooth stones. It's possible that was from a previous battlefield. But I believe it's a picture, a metaphor that we pull into from the spirit realm, that river, the unseen realm. We pull into reality. Five is the number of grace. By grace, we pull on the promises of God and they become a reality. It's through faith. It's through, it's through understanding that we're not alone. The church is not alone. The church is not going to shrivel up and die. Amen. The church is ever advancing. There's over 2 billion believers on the planet, and we have a cloud of witnesses in, the, in heaven. And there's angels that even triple that. Come on, somebody. Yes. It's so important for us to realize that we're not alone. It says, it was faith that shut the mouth of lions. Verse 34, put out Uh, the power of raging fire and caused many to escape death by the sword. Although weak, their faith imparted power to make them strong. Although weak, their faith imparted power to make them strong. When you believe what God says, when you agree with him, unlimited courage is yours. Just like Mary believing the word of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. All the courage she needs to tell her fiancé, that she was pregnant and a virgin. How many of y'all, how many brothers, like if you were Joseph, you're like, give me that ring back, girl, you're tripping. <laughs> that took some courage to face people and say, I'm, I'm with child. But she said, let it be to me according to your word. She trusted the word of the Lord. And when we trust the word of the Lord, faith imparts power and strength to us. Come on. Faith sparked courage within them And they became mighty warriors in battle. The author of Hebrews is saying like, listen, you're a warrior. And I know you fought some battles. But keep believing. Keep running the race. Keep moving forward. 
Because we've got to keep doing what we're called to do. And the Bible says faith sparked courage within them. Pulling armies from another realm into battle array. Faith-filled women saw their dead children raised in resurrection power. Come on. In the main text in Hebrews chapter 12, he begins to go through. We're surrounded by these men and women of faith. And then he says this, let us lay aside every weight. Say, lay aside every weight. I want to talk about this in the passion. It's possible, one of the interpretations, these weights were wounds that were pierced by arrowheads. One of the reasons we feel like we can't run the race with endurance is because we're still wounded. We still got arrowheads, these weights within us. And if that's what the author is meaning, then it's like it's time to allow Jesus to heal the wounds and remove those weights so we can run the race. And he says the sin that so easily ensnares us. A lot of times we read that and we just think, well, you know, I have this one thing that I just, man, I just can't break the cycle. That could be the case, but I believe the sin is the sin of unbelief. Because when we believe and trust, we're transformed. All the other little things, the little foxes that stand in the vine, they fall off. They go away. When you trust in Jesus, when you look to him, then it says run with endurance. Say endurance. endurance. The race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. There's something about beholding. In the Old Testament, uh, Numbers chapter 21 is a story where You know, the people of God are being stubborn. None of us are like that now. But back in the Old Testament, they were stubborn. But we're not, we're never stubborn, right? Come on, somebody. (laughs) And, uh, And all these snakes, venomous snakes come. And God says to Moses, build a staff and put a serpent, a bronze serpent on it. And when they look to the bronze serpent, they'll be healed from the venomous snakes and, and they'll be free. And Jesus said, the same way Moses lifted up his staff, the son of man will be lifted up. How many know later on in John, I think 13, he says, when I'm lifted up, what was he talking about? The cross. I will draw all men unto me. And the author saying, listen, these battle wounds will be healed when you look to Jesus. When you lay aside these weights, there's something about just beholding him the same way that they would look to the staff and be healed. We're healed from venomous Things from our past, bitterness and ought and resentment, and we must let them go so that we can run the race that is set before us. Can you say amen? amen? We cannot allow any past wounds to determine if or how we run the race. So it, it trying to deter us from keeping our eyes on Jesus. We have to keep our eyes on him. First Thessalonians 5.24, let me encourage you. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Isn't that a good word? Write that down. Put it on your mirror. Declare it. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Philippians 1.6, I love this. Being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He began a good work, will complete it. He's faithful. Don't quit. Keep moving forward. Don't grow weary while doing good. I remember a time in ministry where my wife and I were, uh, we were really going through it, and it was probably the first couple of years of being senior pastors, and we f- felt some arrows, and uh, we felt weighted down from these arrows, and uh, I remember I was like, Lord, I don't even know what to do right now. Like, I, I just feel like quitting and throwing in the towel, and, uh, and the Lord's like, I called you to throw in the towel. <laughs> What are, you, what are you thinking, you know? And there's many times these, these times that we go through, that I've been through, it's praise that gets me through it. It's worship that gets me through it because I get my eyes off everything else and I look away from everything else and I look to him. Uh, and it's very powerful. And one of these times I felt like the Lord said, my wife and I were just broken over some things going on uh, in the ministry and, you know, betrayal and, uh, things like that, which is just life, right? It happens. And 
So we, uh, we felt like the Lord says, I want you, if I could just phrase it this way, I want you to call a solemn assembly. How many remember in the Old Testament the, the, the term solemn assembly where the people of God would come and turn their hearts to him? But it was a sacred gathering. You remember we've been talking about a corporate encounter. You see, it's interesting because all the stuff that we're reading, I believe it happens through Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. We cannot run this race alone. We are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. And, and so the Lord says, call a psalm assembly. So we just picked uh, all of our key leaders in our church, and we said, we're going to worship and pray in our house, and we're going to pour into you. And so we had um, all of our leaders come. And I remember like the second or third gathering, we're singing, and we're worshiping. And I'm on my guitar, and we're singing a, a throne room song. You know what a throne room song is? Yeah. Where it's like you're singing, uh, you know, something connected to what we read maybe in Isaiah 6. The angels crying, holy, holy, holy. Or the book of Revelation chapter 5 where, you know, the, the elders cast down their crowns at the feet of Jesus. It's worship that's high praise where it just goes vertical. Like you're not just singing about what God can do. You're not just praising him for what he does. You're worshiping him for who he is. So we're worshiping. It's throne room worship. We're singing holy, holy, holy. And this melody comes out, and this chord progression begins to come out. And a song of victory was birthed in one of the lowest valleys of my life through a solemn assembly. We did what God said, and we had a corporate encounter. The song, the name of the song is Ancient Praise. Let me read just a, a few of the lyrics to you. We've done the song here a couple of times, but I want to read this. Here's verse 1. He's building his house, his kingdom goes forth. The power of hell will not prevail. For 2,000 years, his church advances. People rise up and his presence increases. Oh, your kingdom come. Oh, your will be done. And the melody, was, the melody came before the lyrics fully came. And it was like this heavenly sound and song we're singing. This ancient Holy prayer that the church has been praying for 2,000 years. Verse 2, our hearts are joining. His temple is growing. His love is revealed and oneness increases. There is a prayer, an ancient praise, a sound releasing his reign. Oh, a holy prayer. Oh, an ancient praise. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And then the bridge, one of my favorite parts. I prophesy to all creation, you were made to worship him. I call forth the bride into her glory, you were made for victory. Amen. I call forth the bride, that's you and I, you were made for victory. Can you say amen? amen. So one of the lowest places we come together and the Lord gives us this song of victory. This song became something that we would sing as a corporate body on Sundays. And it, man, it just took, uh, it just brought us into a new realm of authority as a people. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you feel defeated, you need to know it's not the will of God. Well, I just feel like the Lord has me in defeat right now to teach me a lesson. Lies. He gives us victory. He does not give us defeat. Now, there's wilderness times in our life. We can learn from it. We can grow from it. But God is with you. He's for you. And not only that, I'm with you. I'm for you. And so are the, the millions of saints that have gone before us. We are surrounded, come on, by a cloud of witnesses that are cheering us on. There's a revelation that we get when we realize that we're not alone. We run. We run with endurance. I love this verse in 2 Corinthians 2.14. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. Always. Always. All caps. Always. See it that way. God does not lead you in defeat. And the way we pray and the way we sing and the way we fellowship and the way we preach the gospel must be from a place of God lead us in, leading us in triumph. Amen. Sometimes I look at my wife. She looks so beautiful. And I'm like, you look so triumphant today, Rochelle. Everywhere you go, you just release victory. 
because we are a victorious people. We're more than overcomers through him who loved us. Come on. And I'm not just, I'm not just saying like, oh, that just sounds like word of faith. No, this is a reality Jesus has won for us 2,000 years ago. If we, if we got a glimpse and begin to walk in this type of triumph, man, the people around us would literally see Jesus all over us. Amen. We are the church militant, possessing the land for Jesus. And the church triumphant are the cloud of witnesses cheering us on. And the Bible goes on and says, and through us, God gives us, he always leads us in triumph. And through us, manifests or diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. In other words, when you walk in this triumph that he leads us in, Jesus, just the fragrance of Jesus just goes all over. Come on. That's the kind of fragrance we need to be manifesting. Sometimes at the dinner table, my kids be manifesting different kinds of fragrances, and I don't like it. Flatulence. The pastor, what do you preach on? Oh, running the race and flatulence. All right, praise God. God always leads us in triumph. The way we pray, the way we talk, the way we preach the gospel should be this way. God does not lead you in defeat. You're not a defeated people. You're a victorious, glorious bride that he's preparing. Hello? Hebrews chapter 12 at the very end of this, and this is in closing. This is so powerful. He goes on, he says, but you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, an innumerable, innumerable company of angels. How many know there are angelic hosts all around us? I don't know, there are angels that are assigned to our life, not just guardian angels, but angels assigned to you to protect you and to help you. Worship leaders have worshiping angels assigned to them. Hello? Yeah. People that go in certain places have protecting angels that are assigned to them. The Bible says his angels go before us. They've been set charge over us. We need to start believing. Some of the angels assigned to us are bored because we don't believe that they're there or we don't realize how important it is that we thank God that when he speaks and says something, angels help us carry that out. I'm not talking about the worship of angels, no, but it'd be ignorant to not be aware that there are angelic hosts all around us. You remember Elisha's servant is scared. He's tripping. He's freaking out. We're surrounded. What are we going to do? He says, no, you don't see what you're really surrounded by. Lord, open his eyes. His eyes are open. All of a sudden, he sees all of the hosts of heaven. He says, there are more with us than there are with them. This is what the author says, that in our innumerable company of angels, we're on the winning side. Jesus won. So let us keep moving forward courageously. Verse 23, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and the blood of sprinkling that speaks better than that of the things of Abel. Can you say amen? amen. The city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. I want to encourage you to run the race, to lay aside the weights, to lay aside the, the arrowheads, if you will, and allow God to heal the wounds, the wounds from the past, the wounds of feeling alone, the wounds of betrayal, and the sin that so easily ensnares us, the sin of unbelief and any other sin, for that matter, and that we would run with endurance the race that is set before us. Remember that we are to set a pace. It's not a sprint. We're set a pace, but the pace that we set shouldn't be too fast. Because when you drive in the fast lane, it's harder to yield. Set a pace where you're continually yielded to him. Sometimes you got to slow down. He says, look unto Jesus, looking away from every distraction, beholding him who is the author and the finisher and everything in between. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We will not allow any past wounds to determine if or how we run this race. 
we behold you. Father, I pray that you bless your people. Would you lift your hands with me and just, I want you to receive courage right now uh, as somebody who's in your life, as a pastor, as a leader. Maybe you never hear this. I'm going to say the same words that a spiritual father said to my life, the same words my own dad said to my life. He says, I'm behind you 100%. Keep running. Don't quit. Don't be discouraged. Don't be afraid. Be strong and courageous. God's with you. I speak it over your life. I can still hear my dad. I'm so thankful for my dad. Go get him, buddy. Go get him. Keep moving forward. Do what you're called to do. I say it over your life. I prophesy if you felt like you can't run because of weights, because of wounds, because of those arrowheads. I remove those out right now in the spirit. Words of rejection. Word curses. Words that are not from heaven. Every assignment of the enemy that is over you, I break the power of it in Jesus' name. Church hurt, gossip, slander, discord, every arrow removed right now in Jesus' name. Every word that you've believed about yourself that's not true, when you look in the mirror, you see a warrior. You see somebody that is whole, not a wounded person ready to throw in the towel, but a warrior ready to run the race. I speak courage over you, and I tell you again, I'm behind you 100%. Can you hear those words? Can you hear the words of heaven over you that God is for you, not against you? Can you say amen? Lift your hands with me one more time and just receive courage, receive strength. Lord, thank you for every, every person in this room. Thank you, Father. Every business owner, I'm behind you 100%. Every daughter, every woman of God, I'm behind you 100%. Chrissy, I'm behind you 100%. (laughs) Melody, I'm behind you 100%. Kim, I'm behind you 100%. Jim and Heidi, we're behind you and your family 100%. Speak it over your life. Words of grace and courage right now. Be encouraged. Let my words release heaven. Heaven's courage to run, to get up, to stand up, to rise up, to be an overcomer, to walk in overcoming power. You have an overcoming spirit. If God is for us, who can be against us? I release hope and faith over you in Jesus' name. Let faith arise. Mark and Leah, I'm behind you 100%. We love you. We support you. I want to see you fly. Every single person, every parishioner, every son, every daughter, every mother, father, every family, every marriage. I speak it over your life. Ha! Be strong and courageous. Can you say yes? I receive it. Dad, I speak it over you and your family. I'm behind you 100%. Kingdom visionary, eyes to see. It's time to run the race. As a church body, it's time to run the race. We might have had some some arrows, some spearheads, but we're taking them out. As we look to Jesus, we're whole. Can you say amen? We look to what he has for this body. We don't look back at disappointments or heartaches or betrayal or hurts. We look forward to what God has for us as a people. Lord, thank you for healing and wholeness. Whoa, Rochelle, would you go lay hands on Patty for me real quick? Just keep your eyes on the Lord just for a moment. Keep praying. The Lord is healing rejection. Right now, there's just a spirit. There's a, a an oil of heaven. Wow. The Lord's just highlighting some people. I just want to wait on the Lord for just a moment. Father, thank you for wholeness. Can we just receive his love together right now? Thank you for wholeness right now. Would you come here, sir, real quick? Thank you for wholeness right now. Would you just pray? 
release, Lord, right now. Strength. How many can sense the presence of the Lord? Yeah, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I hear words of disappointment from moms and dads or parental figures. And I just want to break those words that have held you back. They've been like spirit, their weights. They've been like spearheads. Arrowheads, we break them, we remove them right now. Words, the cliche like, oh, you'll never amount to anything. I hear word curses and I'm telling you, whew, the Lord just highlighted these two sisters right now. When you're done, I want you to pray for them. And I'm telling you, the Lord, whoa, families that have disowned you for believing in Jesus or running the race or making decisions for moving and doing a certain thing, going to school here, taking this job. As the family of God, we surround you. We're not disappointed in you. God's not disappointed in you. We're with you. We're for you. In Jesus' name, I break every word of disappointment and I speak the affirmation of heaven over you right now. Just take a moment, let that settle. There's just freedom coming. Freedom, freedom, freedom. I know we've gone a little long. If you'd like a tighter service, just come to the 9 a.m. Praise God. You gotta get up earlier. Lord Jesus, thank you. Actually, we haven't even gone that long. Thank you, Lord. Just a few more minutes. Thank you, Lord. I hear the words of a father speaking to daughters. I'm so proud of you. I, I tell my daughters, I tell my, all my kids, you're my favorite. Don't tell the other kids. I can hear the father saying it over his daughters. Chrissy, he's, you're my favorite. So much favor on you. These young ladies you're praying over, I can hear the voice of the Father. Lord, thank you. I can hear the voice of the Father over the sons. I went back and I hugged you, bro, and I, I just felt the affection of the Father for you. He's so proud of you. He's so proud of you. Bless who you are in God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you pray with me, saints? Just, just say, your kingdom come, Lord. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray in the spirit and pray with understanding. Come on, prayer team. Just pray with me. I want to open the altars up right now. If you just need, if you need that healing oil of heaven to heal the wounds from those weights, I want you to come and just bow down here. We're going to dismiss it in just a moment, but I want to just offer some time to just come up here to kneel before the Lord, just to be in his presence. I want you to come. If anyone needs prayer, I want to pray for some people. I want to lay hands on some people. Just come, come right up to the front. We're going to open up the altars. We'll just give you a minute to come on down and just come on down and be in the presence of the Lord. That's it. Just come on down. Amen. Amen. Anyone else come? Just come and kneel before the Lord before we dismiss. And if we could have our prayer team ready to help me pray over people, but just come and be in the presence of the Lord. Mighty warrior. Mighty warrior. <laughs> Some wounded warriors at the Lord's healing. Some wounded warriors. Strength. Whoa. You know, church hurt goes both ways. Sometimes pastors and leaders have a hard time recovering from sheep bites. But I speak it over you, wholeness and healing in Jesus' name. God's call is without repentance. God's call and gift over your life is irrevocable. He hasn't changed his mind about you. So, Lord, we release the healing balm of heaven over If there's anyone else, just come. Just kneel before the Lord. 
There's healing flowing. Thank you, prayer team. Just begin to lay hands on people. Just release the love of the Father. Release the love of God. Just begin to lay hands on their backs as they're kneeling before the Lord or worshiping. And just release. I release wholeness. I release. I remove the spears. I remove the weights. I remove them now in Jesus' name. Honey, would you come and just pray over them right here and release the... Whoa. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, sometimes... We, uh, in, in our marriages and in family, we can't be family the way we're designed to because we've thrown spears and arrows at each other. Reconciliation, repentance, reconciliation, restoration in that order. Maybe there'll be a time you need to tell your spouse or someone you love, I'm sorry for those, some of those wounds are for me. Forgive me. Let healing come. Let restoration come. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord.